All right, welcome to A Push Chapter 6, Lecture 2. Uh, we're going to be focusing on these two points, creating Republican institutions, 1776 to 1787, and the Constitution of 1787. Now, immediately following uh, the Revolutionary War, there's this question of, where is the power going to lay? Is it going to lay in the states, like we were used to before, or was there going to be a stronger central government where the power was going to reside? Um, what they, the idea, and this is a controversial thing, but what they do come up with is this idea of republicanism, where that uh, the government governs by the consent of the governed. Uh, you only govern because the people allow you to. Um, what you see also in following the Revolutionary War is a trend towards uh, lower class, uh, lesser educated people gaining office, people that never would have gained office before. Um, yeah. Especially the areas like Pennsylvania, and this was really big in. Um, this alarmed people like John Adams, some 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 other elitist patriots, uh, who immediately started calling for certain qualifications. But uh, this is a time period immediately following the Revolutionary War where you, you had a great great freedom. Um, any tax-paying white man could vote. You didn't have to own property in most places. Uh, in fact, in New Jersey, which is outside the norm, but in New Jersey, even women could vote as long as they weren't married. If they didn't have a man in the picture, if they were a widow or if they were an unmarried woman, they actually had the power to vote until 1807. So uh, a little bit outside the norm, but uh, this is also a time period where the women's right movement gets started. Uh, women played a huge role in winning the Revolutionary War. They were making um, homespun cloth. They were making homemade tea. They were farming when the men were away fighting on the battlefields. And afterwards, they say, well, listen, everybody's talking about liberty, equality, uh, and all these things, but they're not talking about us. And so they really throw their hat into the ring and say, hey, well, what about us? We need rights, too. Um, it's still going to be a long time before they get those rights, but the ball gets rolling right here after the Revolutionary War. Um, it's also a time period where there is a loyalist exodus. Uh, they are fleeing the country, this new country. Remember, they think of themselves as British subjects. Uh, they are now basically behind enemy lines, if you will. Many of them flee to Canada, which is still controlled by Britain. Uh, some of them go to England. Uh, but they all speak of kind of a loneliness. Uh, uh, I mean, you're different. You're, you're in a new place that's culturally different uh, than what you're used to. There's 100,000 loyalists who leave the country following the Revolutionary War. Some of those people had their property confiscated. Um, you know, sometimes they would pay them for it, but, but oftentimes they just, you know, they would lose property. Now, the government that we decide that we come up with first following the Revolutionary War is something called the Articles of Confederation, uh, often referred to as the AOC. In the Articles of Confederation, uh, the Patriots envisioned a government with a central government with very few powers. That most of the power, majority power, is going to reside in states. Um, each state has one vote. It would take nine of 13 states to uh, pass a measure. Uh, there was no executive branch. There was no such thing as the president. There was no Supreme Court. There was just Congress uh, made up of two houses. Now, the AOC's major weakness, of course, was that it had no power to tax. And we're broke following the war. We've got to pay off debts. And we don't have a way to tax the states. This is a huge weakness of the AOC. Um, also, there was, for when countries were dealing with us, there was no one person to talk to. Give me the president. There was nothing like that. Who you talk to? Uh, the, a senator for Virginia? Who? I mean, that, that's a big question. Um, so what Congress tried to do under the AOC, uh, something to raise revenue, they tried to sell off Western lands. Uh, we owned everything to the Mississippi River, thanks to the Treaty of Paris. We considered all that Indian land ours now. So we're going to try to sell it off to uh, make money. Slavery is banned north of the Ohio River. Uh, this is a time period when you start seeing the issue of slavery rear its ugly head. It's going to be there all the way up to the Civil War and even beyond. Um, the Northwest Ordinance, you need to know, there were three important uh, factors of the Northwest Ordinance starting in 1784 and working its way up to 1787. Uh, one of those was as a territory's population grew, um, it could become a state, it could apply for statehood. Secondly, that new land would be sectioned off in rectangular grids uh, that would have to sell for at least a dollar an acre. You couldn't uh, undercut value there. And lastly, uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 actually created five of our Midwest states, such as uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Chicago, uh, Ohio, and, and more. 
Now back east, while things were looking fairly good out west, back east things were really bad. That's uh, that's where the war was fought. Uh, economy was in bad shape there. You had some farmers who owed money that couldn't pay it. Uh, that's where you get Shays Rebellion. Uh, Daniel, led by Daniel Shays and these farmers who, who've had enough, felt like uh, they replaced a British tyranny with an American tyranny, and so uh, they, they kind of fashioned themselves after the Patriot cause. Uh, but th ultimately, they failed. They were put down by the governor uh, physically, uh, but it, it kind of brought some issues to light. All right, last little part: uh, the Constitution of 1787. AOC is not working. Uh, absolutely not working, so they decide to scrap it, and they come up with an idea for something called the Constitution. Now, the Constitution from its very beginning was controversial, um, and it basically divides into two major plans. There's the big state plan, known as the Virginia plan. There's the small state plan, known as the New Jersey plan. Uh, small states want one vote per state. Uh, big states, the Virginia states, want uh, po uh, voting based off of population. We'll go into more detail on these things in class. Uh, but they're fighting over it. Roger Sherman steps in and creates something called the Great Compromise, uh, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in class. Um, also, slavery, once again, uh, rears its head. The southern states uh, feel like all their slaves should be represented in their total population. Uh, northern states say, why? You don't treat them as people. Why should you get that power? Uh, Roger Sherman steps in again. We get the Three-Fifths Compromise, where three out of every five slaves uh, counts as a vote. Uh, uh, eventually, the, uh, you, you divide up into two camps. There were the Federalists who supported uh, the Constitution, which is, has a lot more uh, central power, and you had the Anti-Federalists who were afraid of central power and so did not support the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, we'll talk about a lot more detail on these things, but uh, what it took to actually get the Constitution ratified, but it would eventually be ratified and is still the government of the United States even today. Okay. Uh, what was the immediate and long-term significance of the Declaration of Independence? I mean, you know, think about it. You're stating your cause that you are becoming a separate uh, nation from Britain. How did the Declaration shape belief systems and independence movements in the Atlantic world? Uh, you need to really focus on that one and get your answer. And why did the rebels win the war for independence? On paper, it looks like we're going to lose. So what factors helped lead us to victory in the Revolutionary War?